Hi folks, uh, welcome to our vegetable garden. Uh, in this video, I want to talk about biochar compost and how it can help you uh, grow your own food and also have a healthy uh, uh, garden like this one. Now, we've been gardening here for many, many years. Uh, I've had chickens, I've uh, hauled up uh, horse manure, I've done green manure, uh, tilled into the soil, I've also used organic fertilizers. But nothing compares to, to biochar compost and working with nature with a, with a no-till garden, um, mulching, and, uh, and I found that the production that I have here has just been um, far more than I ever had before. So let's go up and have a look at how I make the compost. Okay, so this is the, so this is the compost area here. Um, lots of space in this area to work in, uh, access to, um, to water, to the um, garden shed, and also a, a potting a greenhouse area. And, um, and what I have is a, is a four bin compost here that I make out of um, found materials, essentially. It's, uh, you know, uh, and these are, this is the best thing to use. They're cheap and, uh, and they're reusable. I have, a, I have a four bin system here, but other people with smaller gardens, they can have three bins, two bins. They can even have a very small composting uh, uh, bin like this, and, and that works just as well. So it's important with the size of the bins is to, is to keep them between three and four feet in, in, in width, uh, depth, and height. Uh, and the other important thing to remember throughout all this is you do not turn the compost. So this is my biochar that, that I make, and we'll have a look at that a little later. Yeah, so this is, uh, this is beautiful stuff. It's, uh, it has water in it, uh, and so it's not dusty, which is, which is an important issue. All right, another important thing to remember is to keep your compost covered at all times. This is the compost that I'm using right now um, and have been for the past several months. As you can see, it's uh, beautiful stuff, lots of biochar in this. All, this is all uh, has, has absorbed micronutrients. Uh, there's uh, microorganisms in here, which all benefit the garden. This one here is is a compost that um, I'm actually uh, that I finished with about two months ago. So as you can see, it's there's still uh, there is still various materials, but it's almost good enough to use. Again, all the biochar in there. So you can see it's not quite, it's not quite ready. And uh, I use a compost thermometer to determine, but also looking at it, it's, uh, and it's still several degrees higher than what the finished compost is. But it's certainly usable. And quite often I use this one just to, um, you know, put into the new compost. So this one I finished uh, four months ago. So this is actually ready. This is ready, uh, there's virtually no, no um, worms in it at all. The temperature is the same as the outside. So I could use this as well. So here's the compost I'm working on now. Uh, as you can see, I keep, it, I keep it covered all the time. No meat uh, and, no, and no feces, uh, but pretty much everything else works. Uh, I keep, uh, we put our daily, daily, uh, um, <clears throat> vegetable and um, various things. Um, I guess that should go over there. In 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 this bin here, uh, and I, I put a bit of biochar and and compost in it, just to keep the smell down. And then uh, once a week, I make a compost from here. So I have so I have the uh, the biochar there, and uh, and I also have some extra extra compost here, which I added. It's almost. Um, because this has got microorganisms in it, it's got uh, everything, it needs to be added to that. So I usually put 10% of biochar in, 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 the, in the compost and about, you know, 10% of, of, um, of active compost in there as well. And then of course, all this stuff here, uh, any other thing that go in, um, used hay from the garden, uh, 
uh, maple leaves I put in, um, you know, anything like that that breaks down. Uh, I don't chip anything. That's absolutely unnecessary to uh, chip things. Even even these roses and, and uh, you know, different um, plants. Small amounts of, of, um, of herbivore manure is, is fine in compost, such as horse, uh, sheep, uh, cow manure, but I find more effectively and a lot less work is to add um, some of my urine to, to the, to the uh, biochar and then just sprinkle it in, sprinkle it in. You know, urine is very, very high in nitrogen, uh, but it also has phosphates and, and potash in it as well. So um, I find that that's a you know, very effective way of, of building up the uh, nutrient level in your, in your compost. We have an indoor cat, and, and, and I, um, I, add, um, I add biochar to the litter box, and then pull out the feces every, every day. But I, I, once a week, I add sprinkle that in, because it has a, uh, the, um, the litter I use is, is a wood-based, chip-based um, uh, material, so it's fine to go in the compost. It, it is really important for, for biochar not to be directly added to the garden, uh, because it's, uh, it's, it is not, it's not effective that way. It actually absorbs nutrients from the garden. So it must always be charged, and they can be charged. The best place is, is in a compost and left at least two months, which, which it takes two months to go through it at the minimum anyway. Um, or, or, or you can add it to, to um, you know, different manures as well. This is all wrapped in cardboard. I also, when I'm making the compost, I tamp it down. I push it down. Make sure you pressure it down. You don't want to keep all this oxygen in there because it, 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 uh, it combines with CO2 and it escapes up to the atmosphere, which is you know, defeating the whole pur purpose of climate gardening. Uh, and you notice with this compost, I only lose, so when I'm making compost, I lose maybe 5 to 10 percent, whereas when you're doing turning compost, it drops. You lose a lot of compost because it's all going up and you're, and you're losing your carbon. Carbon is so important for a garden. So as well as being closed off from, from around with, with the cardboard, which, is, which breaks down as well, and I use cleaner, cleaner cardboard, you can see, not, the, uh, you know, not the, um, uh, the, the plasticized or anything like that. You gotta be careful about that. And then again, we cover it up. We cover it up to keep it, uh, these, are old, these are old plastic bags that I used, that I used for, for storing the, the uh, charcoal that have holes in them. Keep them covered up. Uh, and um, and then that's fine. And everything is, you know, there is some escape, escapage of oxygen. And the worms also, there's lots of worms in here. They go down, they bring oxygen, but just enough to be able to, uh, to um, you know, break down. So, so these are, this is working in an anaerobic and aerobic sense. It's fermentation at the bottom, but then it's, it, it's aerobic on the top. And, and that's how, and the other thing, the last thing, I quite often will use paper on here because the worms love the high carbon content of paper. So this is just packing paper. Uh, again, you know, you know, you know, clean as possible. And you'll find the worms will be right underneath this stuff. They just, they just love this. So again, cover it up. Don't be too fussy about it. Just perfect and just let everything, oh, this is the compost uh, thermometer that I use. This is running, uh, this is running at about uh, 10 to 15 degrees higher than what is the ambient temperature. It's about 42 degrees Celsius, uh, about 110, which is uh, 110 Fahrenheit in here, which is absolutely perfect. It's not too hard to, it's not too hot to um, kill the, uh, uh, to kill the microorganisms but it's just hot enough to break down and they're working hard in there. So this compost here uh, needs to be applied to the root zones of plants. And uh, this is very important not to use as a mulch. It goes right to the root zone where they can immediately, they can immediately access it. I find when I pulled up the garlic uh, in a, a month or so ago and also the onions, uh, the, the ones I'm storing, uh, the roots are attached to these chunks of biochar. It's quite incredible. They're, 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 they're after the nutrients in there. This is a no-till garden. Uh, we, it's 
microorganisms in the garden are the same as the ones here. They don't like to be disturbed. They just do their thing. They're happy being left alone. They don't want to be turned over and neither does the garden. So no-till, I mulch it. Uh, I mulch it with this material for, uh, with the bales first. Uh, so I leave that overwintered, it's mulched. I rake it up and then it goes into the compost. So the other thing important about biochar is that it stays in the gar it stays um, in the soil for hundreds of years. It doesn't go anywhere, it doesn't break down, it's stable car carbon. That will look like that 100 years from now. Incredible ability to absorb, that, that's what biochar does, whether it's nutrients or water. And so having this in your garden builds up your humus, which is so important. We've lost so much humus over the years. It's really important when you, when you have a garden it, to, um, to really include the, uh, the other uh, the other wonderful parts of nature, uh, including uh, the bees, the butterflies, um, many others, is uh, the birds, the dragonflies. And uh, for, for that, you have to have a really good mix. So you got, you know, cosmos here. I let, um, I let the barrage and the comfrey grow up in places. Um, there's, uh, you know, we, we plant dahlias. There's lots of different varieties of, 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 of plants. Of course, the sunflowers. And some of this stuff pops up, just, you know, not worrying about weeds too much. Keeping it mulched protects the soil and the microorganisms in there. These peppers here, I love growing peppers. We make, we make um, all our own salsa. My wife really loves to uh, can and that. Um, so, um, so we make all our salsa from tomatoes, onions, uh, the peppers, which I grow in pots. And these are, and, and this is all compost. This is, these pots are, are um, at least one half pure compost. And you can see all the biochar in here. And, and, and look how they grow, they're just incredible. Um, and we're up a thousand feet high. So, uh, so uh, yeah, it makes, a, it makes a very pleasant place to be. And, um, and, and of course you love to work in a pleasant place. So let's go and have a look at the uh, biochar kiln. All right. Yeah, so this is the, this is the material that I use for making the biochar. Uh, I take it um, pretty much all of it from, from our property, which is a, a, a second growth. A lot of this is, is, is dead branches, um, dead, dead uh, small thin trees, um, just waste material that is actually a fire hazard in the forest. Some, sometimes I also get it from neighbors. So it ranges from half an inch approximately up to about three inches in diameter. Uh, that makes perfect biochar and anything less than half inch you just leave in the forest to break down. Anything more you can use for firewood. A really important thing to remember of course is you're dealing with fire when you have a kiln so you have to be extremely careful you don't set your house or your property or your forest on fire. So um, I only do biochar from November through to March. So when, when the weather is wet and it's quite all right to, uh, uh, to burn damp wood uh, as long as it's been seasoned. So, so I cut the wood in the, in the late, uh, late fall um, to early spring. I haul it up here, let it dry, and then, and then I burn it through November to March. So the other really important thing about fire is that I always have uh, a, um, a hose ready, a garden hose with pressurized, and I also have at least five or six buckets of, buckets of water just in case it catches anything on fire. But the beauty with this, uh, with the kiln, now we'll go over here and I'll, so this is what we call a flame curtain kiln. There's different kinds of kilns. Um, I originally had, uh, had a, uh, what is called a Contiki kiln, really an interesting smaller kiln that's been designed. It's used in 40, 50 countries around the world. It's made from one, from one uh, sheet of steel. I found that it was a little small for my applications because I'm using so many longer branches. So I designed this one out of two sheets of uh, eighth inch four by eight steel. And I find this has worked really, really well for me. Um, but it's the same principle as the Contiki. So when you, uh, 
uh, when you start, you, uh, you build a teepee like this out of, out of um, kindling, dry kindling, of course. I always put a, a little bit of um, uh, like really good either cedar or um, uh, anything that burns really well. You start it from the top. You remember with, with any kind of, when you're making biochar, you're always burning from the top so you're avoiding the smoke because you've got to get the, the, the air moving moving from bottom to the top. So you never start from down below here. Even when you're lighting your fire at home, always start from the top in, in, in a wood stove. So I have one here, but normally I would have three, one on either side. But if you had a Contiki kiln, you would just put the one like that. So you get it going. As you start it off, it takes a, it takes a little while to get her going. Um, and then you sort of push it down so the coals, coals are kind of spread out around the base. So you, you know, you got her going. Then you start adding dry, dry, smaller wood. You know, you sort of, you know, you have to play with it a little bit to get the, to get the coals warm enough. It has to be, it heats up, burning at about 600 to 700 degrees Celsius. So it takes a little while to get to that point. You keep adding material as it's, as it starts forming ash, starting to go, uh, starting to go white, you're adding material because you're, you're, not letting the oxygen go in to burn the charcoal. It takes a little while to do this, but after, after you start, you start to see, this is the advantage of, of having a steel kiln, is, um, is because it pulls the air from underneath, swings over, and then burns right at this point. So you can look through this thing, there'll be no smoke whatsoever, absolutely no smoke. And that is, the, that is the, the advantage of having a steel one. For thousands of years, they've been making biochar out of just digging a hole in the ground. And, and they've made it successfully, um, and that's fine. But this is a more, far more efficient and, um, and quicker way of making, making biochar. Um, I keep adding material. It takes me about four or five hours to, um, to do this up to about three quarters high, and then, and then I quench it with water. I, I, have, an, I have an inlet on, uh, on that end there. I connect up my garden hose, um, and then I gradually fill it with water. It only takes, it takes about water up to here, and then it's quenched. And the beauty of that is that you end up uh, with all your, with your biochar, and it's, it's full of water, and of course the water cleanses it. It fills all those billions of pores, pores in there with, with um, water. And then afterwards, I crush, it, I crush it a bit. I've got a pretty simple method of crushing it. And, uh, and then put it into garbage bags and you know, close off the garbage bags to keep the water in there. Because of course, you know, once you, and, th and this is another really important thing in the garden, is that this also not only collects nutrients, but it also collects water. That's basically it. There's uh, lots of information out there about about how to uh, you know how to make biochar. That's available, and there's also a mention on on my website there, a, a book and a couple of websites which are really helpful that I found helpful, and um, and that's uh, yeah that's all I can say. I, I you know I I I think this will really you know really be of interest to people, and particularly when you take this and you make biochar compost from it.